You guys know the phrase, pressure makes diamonds, right? Well, coming out of the 70s into the 80s, the pressure was on for the NBA. From the merger with the ABA to the end of the Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain era. And every single action that they took during the 80s mattered for the survival of it. And so while the pressure was on, the GMs came through and created diamonds in the draft. However, some of those diamonds shattered. So what actually happened to every number one draft pick in the 80s? I was surprised, not because some ended up becoming diamonds, but more because some fell off the shelf way too early. The Golden State Warriors select Joe Barry Carroll from Purdue University. Arguably one of the best pre-Steph era Warriors players of all time. Eh, depending on who you ask. We have, from Arkansas, Joe Barry Carroll. The seven foot center had everything a player would need to dominate on the court. His athleticism made him a feared opponent, especially on the defensive end, where he thrived thanks to his shot blocking and rebounding prowess. He spent his time at Denver East High School, dominating the opposition and eventually averaging a 20.10 rebound double-double in his senior year, which would earn him an All-American honors. From there, he went to Purdue University, where he would become one of the most dominant college players of his era. He would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with other teams led by all-time greats of the sports, like the Magic Johnson-led Michigan State, which they would be tied with as the number one team in the Big Ten during that time. Joe would even get a squad all the way to the NCAA Final Four in his senior season while leading the entire tournament in scoring. This would obviously come with its share of individual awards, as during that year, he would be named to the All Big Ten First Team as well as being a consensus All-American First Team member. But before leaving Purdue for the 1980 draft, he would set numerous school records by being their all-time leader in both blocks and rebounds. From the following season on, problems would start to arise for Joe. While Boston had the first pick that year, they would end up trading it to the Warriors who were offering a young Robert Parrish and their third overall pick who would end up becoming the one and only Kevin McHale. The pressure on Joe's shoulders was immense, as he would be seen as the successor to Wilt Chamberlain by the Warriors fan base. And while he would not have a first season of that caliber, he would still average a respectable 19 points and 9 rebounds that would earn him an all-rookie first team selection. From the following season onwards, problems would start to arise for Joe. Because from 1981 to 1984, he would stagnate around that 20 point and 8 rebound mark, with the Warriors failing to make a single playoff appearance. For a guy who was seen as a franchise defining prospect in his college years, this was simply underwhelming. Not only that, but do you remember the two players that the Celtics got in return? Well, in that same time span, they carried Boston along with Larry Bird to two titles in four years. The Warriors' underwhelming performance and Joe's quiet demeanor led to the media constantly bashing him and giving him nicknames like Joe Barely Cares, which really gave him an unfair rep in the league. This would culminate in Joe going to Italy in 1984 to play a season for Milan's basketball team. And I know this may be kind of confusing seeing he was still in his NBA contract, but let me explain. This all happened because Joe and his agent couldn't come to terms with the Warriors on the player's new contract coming into his fourth year off his rookie deal. And instead of just going with what they offered him on the table, he and his agent would just choose to hold out from signing. And Carroll just wasn't going to let his body wither due to not playing for an entire year, so he would instead decide to go play in Europe. He would actually find quite a lot of success there as he won the league title and the FIBA Korak Cup. And after that, he came back to the NBA and the Warriors finally agreed to give him the contract that he wanted. And there's actually a lot more politics that goes behind the story about how he got his contract, but this is already a 40 minute video, so I'm gonna need to skip out on some stuff. But now that he was back to the Warriors with a new contract and a new head coach in George Carl, this would fill him with a new fire to prove that he could dominate in the biggest league in the world. And so in 1987, after averaging nearly 22 points and 8 rebounds per game, and most importantly, leading the Warriors to the playoffs, he earned an all-star selection. Unfortunately for him, as a 7-footer who played in the 80s, which was a period when the medical staff wasn't as competent as today's league, his body would slowly start crumbling and that 1987 season would prove to be the best of his career. From there on out, he would get traded to play a couple more seasons with the Rockets and then two more with the Nets. And in each one, he would be limited to a bench role as his production slowly declined before he retired full on in 1991. Away from the court, Joe would finally be able to put time into the activities that he really enjoyed as he became a very engaged social advocate, fighting for wrongful imprisonments, and he was able to find the time to get his painting career going. Now here's what we didn't expect. He would find a lot of success as an investment advisor and an author. His Carroll Group, founded in 1993, works as a wealth advisory for high net worth families and athletes. He also wrote numerous books published under his own publishing company. His philanthropy work is quite exceptional too, as his Broadview Foundation has funded college scholarships as well as financing elder care, homeless shelters, and numerous other nonprofits in Atlanta. The Dallas Mavericks select Mark Aguirre, from DePaul University. 
Getting to the NBA with a friend is probably something most basketball players wish for. I would imagine Jason Tatum wanted to play with Bradley Beal since they have been friends since kids. But to actually make that happen? Well, I think Mark Aguirre has been the only person to do that in the NBA. As a kid in Chicago, Mark grew up eight blocks away from his close friend and you guys may know him. Uh, his name was uh, Isaiah Thomas, but they would both follow very different routes when it came to their careers. Because after winning the Chicago Public High School League Championship with George Westington House Prep School, he decided to stay local and play for DePaul University in Chicago. While he would only lead them to an NCAA Final Four appearance, his individual scoring prowess would be enough to impress the voters and give him the College Player of the Year award in 1981. That same year, he would declare for the draft, at the same time as his childhood best friend Isaiah Thomas. They were both seen as the top prospects that year, but according to reporter Dan Dockich, Isaiah allegedly tanked his interview on purpose to get Mark to be the first overall pick. And so, the Dallas Mavericks would draft Mark with their number one overall pick. He would immediately prove to be a walking bucket, averaging more than 18 points per game in just his rookie season. He would steadily keep getting better, averaging 24 points per game as a sophomore before upping that up to 29 in his third season. Along with this, Dallas's record was slowly going up. He would earn three All-Star selections during his MAV tenure, and even getting them as far as Game 7 of the Western Conference Finals in 1988 before falling to the, you know, Showtime Lakers. Unfortunately, despite his crazy offensive game, he was seen as an underachiever. That combined with big locker room problems as the other players didn't like him, would end up getting him traded to the Pistons in the summer of 1988. And take a wild guess, do you know who was on the Pistons at that time? Yeah, his best friend Isaiah Thomas. Rumors have it that he was the one who pushed for a Mark Aguirre trade, and that proved to be a genius decision. Mark would accept a more minor role than the one that he had in Dallas, and the scoring would prove beneficial to the Pistons, as they would go on to earn two rings in his first two seasons there. I mean, he was so selfless that he was the one to ask the coach to up Dennis Rodman's minutes and lower his, knowing that it was the better decision for the team. As age would take a toll on his body, he would slowly start declining, and he would spend one lone season with the Clippers in 93 before deciding to retire. There is this iconic quote from Isaiah Thomas who said that Aguirre basically flushed down the toilet of a Hall of Fame career to be a champion. After all, he went from being the top dog in Dallas, a guy who was averaging nearly 30 points per game in a season, to a more background role player, all for the sake of championships. I mean, at the end of the day, his resume is still quite impressive. This guy was a three-time All-Star who scored more than 18,000 points over the course of his career, and obviously has two rings. Now, while he isn't a first ballot type of player, I think that he should have gotten a spot in the Hall of Fame. But what do you guys think? Was his career good enough to have his name next to the all-time greats? I'd love to know what you guys have to say about it in the comments below. While Mark left the Mavericks as a player hated by the fans, he achieved the ring that they dreamed of nearly 20 years before the franchise would get its own. After retiring, he decided to live a tranquil post-NBA life, getting away from the court, until his appointment just a few weeks ago as the special assistant to the athletic director of DePaul, his old college. But I want to know from you guys, do you think he should have been in the Hall of Fame? The Los Angeles Lakers select James Worthy from University of North Carolina. From one champion to another, we now focus on one of the clutchest players of all time, James Worthy. Ever since he started basketball, he was always the guy who stepped up his game when his team needed it on the biggest stage. As just a high school senior, he would average 22 points, 12 rebounds, and 5 assists to lead his school all the way to the state championship game. His talent would get the recognition that it deserves, as he would take a part in the 1979 McDonald's All-American Game. The North Carolina native would then choose to stay in the state for college and attend UNC. After missing his freshman year due to a broken ankle, he would quickly cement his alpha status in a squad full of future NBA stars and carry them to success. He first carried them to a second place finish in the 1981 NCAA tournament as a freshman. Then in his junior season, he would lead his team in scoring and route to winning the 1982 NCAA title. He would earn the NCAA's most outstanding player award ahead of his other teammates like future NBA champion Sam Perkins and a certain North Carolina freshman called uh, Michael Jordan. Worthy was such a big sensation that year that he would even make the cover of Sports Illustrated magazine and cement his status as the consensus number one prospect in the whole country. This would lead him to forgo his senior season and declare for the 1982 NBA draft. While the number one overall pick that year should have been Cleveland, they had actually traded its rights to the LA Lakers, which meant that James Worthy would find himself added to a squad that had just won the NBA title only a couple months prior to the draft. And for a born winner like him, this was the best situation he could have dreamed for. 
In the middle of these star-studded Showtime Lakers, filled with NBA legends like Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Worthy would dazzle the NBA world in his own way. Despite breaking his leg in his rookie season, James would get the starting spot on the team as a sophomore as soon as he was healthy again. He would be a vital part of the Lakers returning to the finals that year again and he would average 22 points on a crazy 63% shooting in the finals. Despite this, the Lakers would still fall to the Celtics in seven games. The following season though, he would keep those same averages, but this time over the entire playoffs and help get the Lakers back to the finals. In there, a prime Showtime team would steamroll over the Celtics. This back and forth between the two teams is what made the 80s in the NBA so unique. And in this decade, Worthy would have his moment in glory in 1988 in the finals against the Pistons. With a 36 point triple double in game six, to clinch the ring, earning himself a finals MVP. It was games like this that earned him the title Big Game James, because he always knew when to step it up for his team. He would spend the entirety of his 12-year career wearing purple and gold, bringing the Lakers three rings, earning seven all-star selections, and averaging more than 17 points per game over the course of his 926 game-long career. He was one of the biggest LA legends of all time, with his number 42 being retired by the team. Maybe we got it wrong all along. Maybe it was James Worthy's number 42 that was the answer to the universe. After his NBA career, he would go on to the media route. First, he tried his talent as an actor on multiple TV shows, as he was a guest appearance on the TV series Webster, and had a small role in the Star Trek series. Soon, he would realize that he should maybe stick to what he knows best, and that's basketball. And so he would settle with the analyst route, working for numerous LA TV channels and even Warner Cable. The Houston Rockets select Ralph Sampson from University of Virginia. With all the hype surrounding Victor Wembanyama, one could quickly assume that he's the first unicorn that we have seen play like this in the history of the league. After all, imagining a 7-footer hitting jump shot after jump shot after jump shot is hard to do even now, let alone 40 years ago. But believe it or not, this was the profile of Ralph Sampson, who was drafted right in the middle of the 80s. As a 7'4 center, Ralph was an athletic anomaly. If you think that Wembenyama is revolutionary, just imagine what people thought when they saw a 7'4 giant dribble the ball like a guard and hit jump shots 40 years ago. Yeah, this is the monster that Ralph was, and he made sure to destroy the opposition with these gifts, bringing to Harrisburg High School two state championships and showing to the nation a new way for centers to play the game. Every college wanted to have him on their team, but he would decide to stay local and play with Virginia. There, he would take a school that had never won an NCAA tournament game all the way to the Final Four. And by the same occasion, he would become one of the most decorated college players in basketball history. I mean, just listen to his resume. Three Naismith Player of the Year awards, two Wooden awards, and a three-time ACC Player of the Year. Up to that point in time, nobody had ever done it like Ralph. Every single year, he was getting multiple offers from NBA teams, with some even guaranteeing to him that he would be the number one overall pick. Still, having promised his family that he would earn his degree, he decided to finish college. In 1983, the entire world held its breath as Ralph stepped onto an NBA court for the first time after he got drafted by the Houston Rockets. This guy had been on the cover of Sports Illustrated six times in the last four years. The hype train was going at full speed, and everyone saw him as the future of the league. With longtime NBA scout Marty Blake telling the Washington Post, we had the Chamberlain era, we had the Russell era, and the Jabbar era. And now I think we'll have the Sampson era. And well, at first, Ralph did not disappoint. He would become one of the only players in NBA history to get selected as an all-star despite being only a rookie, as he averaged a 20.10 rebound double-double. The following season would see the addition to the team of 1984 first pick Hakeem Olajuwon, which Ralph would accommodate by switching to the power forward position. Despite his slim build, he would continue to thrive, earning three more all-star selections and leading Houston to the 1986 finals. Notably with this iconic shot in the Western Conference Finals against the Showtime Lakers that would send Houston to the finals. Unfortunately, that final series would become the beginning of the end for him. First of all, his attitude issues would flare up, as he notoriously punched Boston 6-1 guard Jerry Sitching out of frustration during Game 5 of those finals. The Rockets would end up losing that series, with Ralph receiving multiple death threats from Celtics fans for going after a player much smaller than him. Secondly, that would be the last season in which he would be 100% healthy, from back injuries to knees that needed to be drained. The seven-foot body that gave Ralph his success would become the source of his downfall. Just one year after those finals, despite Sampson actually being named to the All-Star game that season, he would get traded to the Golden State Warriors. Can you guess who the Rockets got in return? It was actually none other than the 1980 NBA Draft first overall pick, Joe Barry Carroll. The thing is that, at that point in time, it had gotten clear to the Rockets organization that Ralph was ultimately limited compared to Hakeem. And if they hoped to get to new heights, then they had to build the entire team around Hakeem. 
The Warriors were also welcoming as it had a new beginning for the franchise, with George Carl, the team's coach at the time, declaring that Samson's addition changed the course of a sad franchise. Unfortunately for them, while the skill was still there, his body just couldn't handle the NBA rhythm anymore, and so he would miss half of the games in his two seasons there before getting shipped to Sacramento. And after two 20-game seasons there, they would also deal him to the New Jersey Nets, as they just couldn't keep paying a guy who was missing nearly 75% of the games. And 10 games with them would be enough to convince him to retire. The thing is that Ralph just wanted to free himself from all the attention. Despite having had cameras all over him since high school days, according to his friends and family, Samson is actually a very timid guy who doesn't like public attention. And with the amount of scrutiny that he was getting with every injury, he just wanted it to stop. The downfall would unfortunately continue even after he finished his career, as he would lose a big chunk of his NBA earnings thanks to his agent. Tom Collins, allegedly just squandering it away. Not only that, but despite trying his hand at multiple business endeavors like a basketball school, Samson Marketing, and Samson Sportswear, none would really succeed. And this streak of bad luck would end up hitting him on the legal side of things starting in 2003. After a divorce from his wife of 17 years, multiple cases of child support from different mothers would get brought up to Ralph. He would even serve two months in a prison camp near Atlanta in 2007 after accounts of mail fraud done to buy an SUV. In 2012 though, he would catch a break and get the ultimate honor in basketball as he got inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. Now, this decision was seen as quite controversial at the time, considering his personal life stories. But the thing is that a lot of his close friends would end up coming out to defend his name as everyone who personally knew him couldn't find a single bad thing to say about him. Ralph is one of those players who was definitely ahead of their time playing-wise. Now, don't get me wrong, he is still a four-time All-Star, which is better than 99% of the players who have played in the NBA. But only one can imagine the heights that Ralph could have reached in a league where centers are encouraged to shoot, and where NBA players have modern medicine at their disposal to help them play as long as physically possible. But for all of you guys that did watch Ralph Sampson play, what did you think of him? Do you think that he would have been able to survive in today's NBA? The Houston Rockets, who are represented here by owner Charlie Thomas and his daughter Tracy, select Akeem Olajuwon of the University of Houston. Man, this is my favorite person of the draft. Imagine being so great that despite getting drafted before Michael Jordan, no one ever calls you a bust or regrets picking you before him. Selected as the number one pick in the 1984 draft, little did Hakeem know that a couple of spots behind him, the guy who would revolutionize the sport of basketball would get drafted. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Hakeem's story started all the way in Africa as he was born in Lagos to Nigerian parents. He spent his childhood playing soccer and only discovered basketball at the age of 15. At that point, he would fall in love with the game and do everything to play abroad. He would attract the eye of the University of Houston, who invited him for a tryout. But he was such a low status prospect that he found no one waiting for him at the airport, and he found himself having to take a taxi to get to the university. In his first season there, he was like very raw, and would only make the jump to the star that we know today after tirelessly training under Moses Malone during the offseasons. From that point on, he would carry Houston to two NCAA championship game appearances, and despite not winning, he would still be honored with the Most Outstanding Player Award in 1983. He was also a first team All-American by his senior year. And by that time, he was already nicknamed The Dream, thanks to his absurd dunks and his footwork. With the Houston Rockets winning the 1984 coin flip, it was obvious to everyone that the number one pick was going to be Akeem. He was a local hero, and a prospect like never seen before in Houston. His first few years would be spent as Ralph Sampson's sidekick, and together the Twin Towers would even get to the 1996 NBA Finals. And as the years went on, Hakeem continued growing his skill set. It was clear who the Alpha was, and in 1988, they would trade Ralph to the Warriors and make Houston Hakeem's team. I mean, not only that, he was blossoming into one of the best centers ever. He would even lead the league in both rebounds and blocks in 1990 and record a quadruple double in a March game against the Bucks. But his team's record was so bad that he would not get voted for any of the major awards. Even without those awards, he would continue building his own legend in the city, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. And in 1993, that window of opportunity opened for him. Why? Because Michael Jordan announced his first retirement. And let me tell you, with the best player in the league out of conversation, every single team thought they had their chance, each one led by its own historic center. But in the middle of all of those, Hakeem knew that he was the best at his position and that it was his time to shine. He would not half butt it either, and so in 1994, he would have one of the best seasons ever, as he became the only player ever to win a Defensive Player of the Year, an MVP award, a championship, and a finals MVP all in the same season. He had brought to Houston their first ring and was forever a city legend. The following year, the Rockets only finished sixth in their regular season, with a Hakeem who was just coasting through. 
and everyone thought that they weren't a danger that time around. Well, that was until Hakeem turned on the gears and he and Clyde Drexler brought Houston to its second ring in a row, this time beating the Magic led by a young Shaq. Hakeem went on from averaging 27 points per game in the regular season to 33 points per game over the course of the playoffs. That's a 6 point per game increase in the hardest part of the season. 1996 would mark the first full comeback season of Michael Jordan. And so the Rockets championship window was done now. They would try copying the Bulls formula by bringing in Pippen in 1998, but at that point, Hakeem was starting to get too old to get another ring. Don't get me wrong, he was still a top tier player. It's just that after 15 seasons, you can't expect a 7-footer to keep playing with the same energy. He would spend one lone season in Toronto in 2002, but uh, that's something we don't talk about. Upon his retirement, he is and still is the all-time block leader in the NBA. Well, at least in the recorded era, with the Rockets retiring his number 34. His post-NBA career would be spent doing two things, earning money thanks to Houston's real estate market and training up-and-coming prospects. He apparently made more than $100 million thanks to buying and selling houses, which is equal to what he actually made as an NBA player. On the court, as the footwork genius that he is, Hakeem has been solicited by numerous players to get him to train them, with some of his biggest pupils being Yao Ming, LeBron James, Giannis, and Kobe Bryant. His family seems to have an innate talent for basketball, as his eldest daughter, Abby, played in the WNBA and in numerous other professional teams across the world. And while her playing career is over, she seems to be thriving in the coaching side of things, as she just got hired as an assistant coach in the WNBA by the Connecticut Suns. And one of his sons seems to also be quite promising, with his son Abdullah, who averaged a double-double as a starter for the Clements Rangers and led his high school team to their best record in nearly 10 years. But now, he is in his freshman year of college playing for the Detroit Mercy Titan, and he's one of those young players that we should definitely keep an eye on in the future. New York Different Lance, here's David Stern with the announcement. Pick, select Patrick Ewing. Three things scream New York. Central Park, Statue of Liberty, and Patrick Ewing, a true icon and legend of our game. Patrick Ewing is one of those guys that history seems to not be giving the recognition that he deserves, and I'm here to fix that. After he was born in Jamaica, he would move to Boston to continue building upon his basketball dreams. There he would take Cambridge Ranch and Latin School to heights that they'd never reached before, winning them three consecutive state championships. Every single college in the country was fighting to recruit Ewing. To the Boston fans' despair, he would not stay local, as he decided to play for Georgetown. He was actually very close to playing at UNC with Michael Jordan, but during Pat's visit to North Carolina, he would stumble into a KKK meeting near the school campus, huh? which made it pretty easy for Patrick to decide against that school. His winning ways would continue in college, and I'm sure that what he turned Georgetown into was way better than anything that they had in their wildest dreams when they recruited him. To give you some context, in its history, the school had only reached the NCAA Final Four once before Ewing's arrival. In his four years there, though, they would reach it three additional times, with every single one of those ending with a championship game appearance. He would also bring to the school their only NCAA title at the time after beating the Houston team led by Hakeem Olajuwon. Add to that three first All-Team American selections, four Big East Defensive Player of the Year awards, and sweeping every College of the Year award in his last season. And you have the resume of one of the greatest college players in history. You can easily guess that his arrival in the NBA was one for the ages, in what is now considered to be one of the most controversial moments in NBA history. After all, the year of his draft was the first one where the draft lottery had started. And so when David Stern, who was a known Knicks fan, pulled the envelope with New York's name on it, everyone saw it as a rigged event, with one theory even suggesting that the envelope that had the Knicks name in it had been put into the freezer overnight so that it would be colder than the rest. After all, at that time, a big market like New York City needed a star of the caliber of Patrick, and it just so happened that they got him. Anyway, he would prove to be everything that they had been promised, earning 11 all-star selections in his first 12 years in the league. He made the Knicks team a feared franchise in the 90s, and in the era where centers dominated, he stood out as one of those big names that raffled all the awards. On the team side of things, things were a bit tougher. After all, when you spend your prime playing in a conference with MJ's Bulls, it's kind of hard to go far in the playoffs. And the biggest regret in Patrick's career is probably when MJ was retired in 1995 and he missed a finger roll in Game 7 of the semifinals against the Pacers. And bounce to Ewing, down to three, down to two, Ewing, not over the hit, and it's all over. 
I mean, he did get to the finals in 1994, but he would totally get outplayed by Hakeem, who wanted that title more than anything. And this would be the legacy of Patrick Ewing, an individual monster who gave New York their best years, but just wasn't able to get them to the ring. And when you get a guy like Shaq crying when talking about you, you know that you're special. Pat did end up playing a couple more years on other teams after his Knicks tenure, but those are like the Tony Parker Charlotte years or the Hakeem Toronto ones. We don't talk about them. He would quickly take his experience in basketball and turn it towards coaching. As early as 2002, he was already an assistant coach for the Wizards. From there on out, he would keep jumping from team to team, eventually helping the Magic get to the finals in 2009 thanks to his mentorship to Dwight Howard. After a few more years as an assistant for the Hornets, and after having gotten the chance to coach his son in the Summer League, Pat would try a head coach role in 2017 for Georgetown. While he would help them win the 2021 Big East Championship, his overall results were quite mediocre, and that led him to being fired in 2023. Even though Patrick Ewing never won a ring, he still had a huge influence on basketball in the late 80s and the 90s. And for that, he will never be forgotten in NBA history. And he especially won't be forgotten in New York history. The Cleveland Cavaliers select Brad Darty of the University of North Carolina. For any normal NBA player, earning multiple all-star selections is hard. Setting historic firsts in car racing is even harder. Doing both, though? That's something that only Brad Doherty could do. Brad was a genius. I mean, he was so smart that he skipped the eighth grade. And despite only starting basketball, and hear me out, 10th grade, he would carry his high school team all the way to the state finals in his senior year. He always was the youngest guy in his class and his squad. And he would decide to play college ball for the University of North Carolina. That would be no different. Because as a freshman, Brad was only 16 years old. As around him in the team were recent NCAA winners like Sam Perkins and uh, Michael Jordan. The 6'10 center would not be intimidated as he started slowly but surely developing his game. This would culminate in 1986 when he would be named to the All-ACC first team as well as the All-American first team. From there on, he would catch the eye of the Cleveland Cavaliers. He would be part of the young core that Cleveland was trying to build along with Ron Harper and John Williams. And to their credit, all three would be in the all-rookie team that season. It's just that Brad would be able to take the leap forward to stardom and start earning one all-star selection after another thanks to his 20.10 rebound seasons, with a grand total of five selections. Unfortunately, he wouldn't go much higher than that, and at just 28 years old in 1994, Brad would be forced to retire due to nagging back problems, signaling the end of a career who a guy who had been given more time, he probably could have made it into the Basketball Hall of Fame. But that's not the end of Brad's story. If anything, that's actually the start. Brad would quickly find this as an opportunity to turn towards one of his favorite things in the world, and that's NASCAR racing. He would first co-own a NASCAR Camping World Truck Series team in 1997 before co-owning the JTG Doherty Racing Team and getting into the real NASCAR Cup Series. In 2023, after his team's driver Ricky Stenhouse Jr. won the Daytona 500, Brad would become the first black team principal to win that race. He would also work with both ESPN and NBC as an analyst and caster, with multiple NASCAR fans claiming that if he continues on this path, he could eventually get into the Hall of Fame of that sport. Not the kind of success that we would expect from an NBA first overall pick, but still impressive in its own way. The San Antonio Spurs select David Robinson from Navy. If you see the Spurs getting a first overall pick and drafting a big man with it, chances are that he's going to be pretty successful, and David Robinson is no exception. Out of any player in NBA history, David's beginnings are probably the most intriguing. Because up until his senior year in high school, he had never played on a basketball team. But seeing how he had a growth spurt just before that senior year, the Osborne Park High School team coach would get on to him about joining the team. And from there, David's talent in the sport would slowly but surely start shining. For college, he would choose the U.S. Naval Academy, where he chose to major in math. Now, at the time, the 6'6 Robinson only had a couple of basketball seasons under his belt. And getting to the NBA was probably not even a dream at that point. But he would continue to grow. And that, adding to the Navy's physical training, made him an athletic monster. In his senior year, Robinson would sweep all the College Player of the Year awards and lead Naval Academy to an NCAA Final Eight appearance. This was enough to get the Spurs to draft him with their first overall pick in 1987. But he would not see an NBA court for two years, as he had an obligation to serve on active duty for at least two years. This would mean that we would only see him at the beginning of the 1989 season after he had earned his now iconic nickname, the Admiral. His rookie season was worth the wait for both Spurs fans and the NBA world. He would at the time cause the most significant turnaround ever done by a rookie. Spurs from a 21 and 61 record to a 56 and 26 one. This would be done thanks to one of the most impressive rookie stat lines in NBA history. 24 points, 12 rebounds, and nearly four blocks and two steals. And yeah, he was named as the rookie of the year and was an all-star in the same season. One year was enough for him though to cement his status as a star in the league. And he was soon getting deals from every single corner with Sega even making a game about him. 
I mean, I never played the game, but I'm curious to know if you guys ever played it. From there on out, he would keep carrying San Antonio to the playoffs, all while accumulating personal accolades for himself. Multiple All-Stars, All-NBA, and All-Defensive Team selections, a Defensive Player of the Year, a scoring title, and an MVP. The Admiral was the most versatile player in that era, dominating on both offensive and defensive sides of the court. He would leave a historic mark on the league with numerous record-shattering performances, like the 71-point game of the 93-94 season to clinch the scoring title versus Shaq or his quadruple-double performance against the Pistons in that same season, which is still the last one recorded to this day. In 1996, despite having only played in seven seasons up to that point, the Admiral would get a spot on the list of the NBA's 50 greatest players of all time. Still, on his own, he would not be able to carry the team to many playoffs, as disappointments would start piling up on him. First after losing in 95 to his rival Hakeem, then falling to injuries and missing the 96-97 season. Luckily for him though, that would mean that the Spurs would get another number one overall pick, and this time, they would choose Tim Duncan with it. And from that point onwards, the rest is history. The Twin Towers would mark the beginning of the Spurs dynasty, with David winning the 1998 and 2003 titles before retiring in the following season. Oh, and don't think that he forgot about his national duty. David Robinson is a two-time Olympic Games gold medal winner, with one of them being with the legendary 1992 USA Dream Team. All of this would obviously lead him to getting into the NBA Hall of Fame in 2009. His legendary status would also continue off the court. Being both a successful businessman and a philanthropist, David seems to have succeeded in his post-NBA career. He launched with one of his friends, who was also a former Goldman Sachs employee, a private equity fund which has a portfolio of over $100 million. Not only that, but it is said that he also co-owns a luxury car dealership in Texas. Most of these endeavors have one objective, and that's to help him fund all of his charity work. After all, he directly donates 10% of all the profits from his equity fund to charity. He also opened a non-profit private school in 2001 to give opportunities to inner city children. I mean, I could do an entire video on David's philanthropy work. So to summarize it, just know that the NBA Community Assist Award comes with a plaque dedicated to David Robinson. That's how big of an impact he had. It seems like his sons also got his superhuman athletic genes. One of his three sons, Corey, was a four-star wide receiver prospect in high school before playing for Notre Dame. And there he shined, even getting named first team academic All-American. Unfortunately for him, a series of head concussions would force him away from the field and into an analyst career. Still, he didn't abandon sports, as reports from a few months ago surfaced that Corey was now training to get into the US Olympic rowing team. One of his other sons, Justin, also excelled in the sport, but this time it was basketball just like his father. In college, he would be a walk-on for Duke and would slowly but surely start getting minutes here and there for the team. He would eventually go play in Europe, though he did have a small stint with the Spurs Summer League team in 2021. NBA Draft, the Los Angeles Clippers select Danny Manning of Kansas. Yet another center, but this time it's the 6'10 college legend, Danny Manning. During his high school years, Danny would dominate two states. First as a junior leading Page High School to a 26-0 season and a North Carolina State Championship. Then as a senior at Lawrence High School, he would be named the Kansas Player of the Year. He was an offensive juggernaut and a true scoring machine who could put the ball in the basket anywhere on the court. The jump from state star to national superstar would occur in his college years, because at that level, when it came to putting the ball in the basket, there was nobody like him. He would first carry Kansas to the NCAA Final Four in 1986, but would ultimately fall down to Duke. Still, Danny's name started to be more and more present in the mouth of basketball fans. In 1998 though, Danny's crowning moment would occur when he would lead Kansas to the NCAA title. The thing is, at that time, it was done in a way that no one had ever seen before. Imagine Imagine a team going into a tournament with a 21-11 record and still having hopes to win. This was the exact situation of the unremarkable 1998 Kansas University team at the beginning of the tournament. It's just that with every game that would go on, Danny would single-handedly carry the team to the following round, leading them to the title and getting honored as the most outstanding player in the tournament. This beat was so impressive that it would end up being called Danny and the Miracles, and it's still arguably the greatest single NCAA tournament performance by a player. That season, he would sweep every single player of the year award and earn the status of top prospect in the upcoming draft. This guy was so good that he is considered by many to be one of the greatest college players ever. He would get drafted by the LA Clippers, but he would only play for the first two months of his rookie season before getting sidelined due to a torn ACL. Still, from his freshman year onwards, he would start slowly bringing his offensive domination to the NBA. And so after averaging like 16 points per game in his second season, he would slowly start upping his production until he would reach the 23 points per game by his fifth one earning for himself his first All-Star selection. He would continue with his momentum and earn a second All-Star selection just the following season before getting traded to the Hawks, in exchange for the one and only Dominique Wilkin, and one of the biggest blockbuster trades of that era. 20 games later, he would pack his stuff and head for Phoenix, where injuries would rid him of his alpha status and force him to reimagine his game. But kudos to him, because that's precisely what he did. 
Manning became a lethal scorer off the bench, the kind of sixth man that every team dreamed of having. So much so that he would end up winning the 1998 Sixth Man of the Year award, and from there on out, he would just continue jumping from ship to ship, playing one season in Milwaukee, Utah, Dallas, and Detroit before retiring in 2003 but he wouldn't stay away from basketball very long. As five years later, he was again on the bench at Kansas University, but this time as a coaching assistant. He would find great success in both recruiting and player development, sending 12 players to the NBA during his seven years there, and capping off this period with the 2008 NCAA title, coaching big schools like Tulsa, Maryland, and more recently, Louisville. It was in Tulsa that he had the most success though, earning Conference Coach of the Year back in 2014. Manning was also a legend away from the court. He was one of the most engaged athletes in philanthropy that we have ever seen. Try to think of like a random nonprofit, and chances are that Danny has already helped them. I'm talking about everything from Special Olympics to donating to community shelters, all the way to stuff like sponsoring youth basketball camps. We appreciate you, Manning. The Sacramento Kings select Purvis Ellison from the University of Louisville. After nine All-Stars, we were bound to have at least one player who just didn't get there. Well, Purvis Ellison is unfortunately that guy, but his career could have gone way differently. He was just one of those guys who had been gifted a clutch gene from day one. That first manifested when he led Savannah High School to a Final Four appearance in the state championship, as the 6'9 center earned himself a McDonald's All-American selection. It was in his college years, though, that Purvis's legend would be written. As a Louisville freshman, he would carry the team to an NCAA championship, and with clutch game after clutch game, Purvis would even earn the Most Outstanding Player of the Tournament award, making him the only freshman since the 40s to get it. This would make him a national superstar. So much though that he would get selected to represent Team USA in the 1987 Pan American Games, next to NBA legends like David Robinson. And there, he would only bring home the silver medal, as they would lose to the Brazilian team led by the legendary Oscar Schmidt. At the end of his four-year college career, the Sacramento Kings would decide to bet on Purvis with their first overall pick hoping that he would be the player to turn their franchise around. As history would know it though, things would not go that way. He would miss more than half of his rookie season thanks to an injury. So the Kings would just ship him away to the Bullets. And at first, that seemed like a terrible mistake. In his sophomore season as a backup center, he averaged nearly 10 points, 8 rebounds, and 2 blocks. And in his following one, he was finally trusted enough to be given the starting role. And so he would show the world why he was the first overall pick. A 20-point, 11-rebound double-double, along with nearly 3 blocks and 3 assists per game. With a stat line like that, he had shown that he was among the best players in the league, and so he would win the NBA's Most Improved Player Award for that season. I mean, the whole NBA world was ready to start clowning the Kings, but unfortunately for Purvis, they would be proven right. A series of injuries would end up with Purvis getting waived only two years later, and despite the Celtics picking him and Ellison staying with them for five years, he would only average less than 39 games played per season for the team. And so, after nine additional games with Seattle in the 01 season, Purvis would decide to retire. His time in the NBA was quite beneficial for him, as he accumulated enough knowledge on the X's and O's of the games that he would quickly start a coaching career, with him ending up as a coach in the Life Center Academy, working with up-and-coming basketball prospects and helping them reach new heights in their skills. One of those players would end up being his own son Malik, who would eventually play for some team in the G League before going to play in Europe and more precisely in Finland. From Hakeem to David Robinson, a lot of franchises seem to have gotten players that completely turned around their history and helped carry the NBA into the 90s. But what do you guys think about the 80s draft? Let me know. One thing is for sure though, and it's that the 90s would end up having far different results than what teams in the 80s got, with some players reaching far greater heights than anyone drafted in the 80s, while others would disappoint more than anyone that we've seen in this video. I know, sounds crazy, right? Well, let me tell you what actually happened to every number one draft pick in the 1990s all in this video, right here.